Kia ora tātou, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, we, we do try and, and get science its an appropriate place in policy setting. Um, so I, my, my job here today is, is as uh, Paul said, is to talk about regaining consumer trust in a digital age. Now, I'm a, I'm a biophysical scientist by training. Um, the social sciences were, were something completely alien to me um, until my frustrations probably overflowed um, in uh, the people we, we target our research at not actually taking up our recommendations, no matter how compelling the argument was. And so I, I've delved deeper into that subject to try and, um, and understand it uh, to a greater degree. So the, I, I don't claim expertise in this. this is, these are my musings, and I welcome um, discussion and questions afterwards. So to start off, um, look, Ralph Waldo Emerson said it in, in a way that I could never say it or as, as succinctly anyway, is that the, the first farmer was the first man and all of historic nobility rests on the possession and use of land. And if you were to extend that, that, that is to food production systems. Um, so the people that produce food for the masses um, uh, deserve better of humanity to use um, Jonathan Swift's um, eloquent prose. And if you look at the success that we've had, um, certainly over the last 50 years, um, since Norman Borlaug's major revolution in, in the genetics of crops and, and the succession of agricultural chemicals and fertilizers, etc., that have come through that time, we have managed to uh, increase the population of the world by over 3 billion people and shrink the number of people undernourished by nearly 250 million at the same time. So we're, we're feeding in excess of, of 3 billion more people now than we were when Norman Borlaug accepted that challenge. So you would think that, um, you know, it would be a time to celebrate. Um, and, but, um, you know, if you look at any of the surveys that are out there, um, New Zealand, it's not just New Zealand, but certainly, obviously, our newspapers highlighted in New Zealand, but it's pan, pan global. Farmers are despondent. Uh, we, we, we're going through a period, uh, a halcyon period, if you will, of, of stable commodity prices that have, are historically high, um, bank interest rates that are historically low, uh, really low unemployment levels, um, and, and yet farmers actually have, uh, believe, and uh, by farmers I'm using the term quite liberally to orchardists and, and fisher uh, people, etc. as well, um, are quite despondent about the future of their professions. Um, and so why is that? Well, look, there's a few obvious examples. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that sprung to mind to me over the weekend was, uh, you know, a litany of, of pseudoscience articles that have, that have proliferated over the last uh, year in particular, but it's been building, um, uh, that, that basically attack particularly animal agriculture um, for its role in, in human health and uh, environmental degradation. And, of course, that fuels also the the social media uh, side of things with NGOs and activist groups certainly uh, stringently attacking that sector as well. And of course, the, the world has changed. You know, we now, we now have a different type of bully. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to be a, a six foot four um, Olympic powerlifter and street fighting god when you're pushing keyboards, keys to actually achieve those, um, those accolades. But you'd be forgiven for thinking that uh, we have an absolute black and white choice Either we have animals in our diet or we have a healthy climate. You can't have both. Or we have a healthy environment. We can't have both. And Jack Bobo, the CEO of um, a future food uh, company, um, it, it said that you know, people have never cared more, nor known less, about how their food is produced. And I think that speaks to a lot of why we're, we're seeing that, that contradiction of an environment that, that should be conducive to positivity in the food production sector and yet, that sector is very heavily influenced by uh, negative feelings. And I, I would argue this is really, a really, really important topic because we have a massive challenge facing us. This is the calorie requirements for us to produce to feed the population of the world over the last 2,000 years and through for the next 30. Now, to put things in perspective, we have to produce almost as much food in the next 30 years as we have in the last 2,000 that's just in terms of calories. That's not in terms of nutrition. That's just in terms of meeting our energetic needs, never mind the amino acid and micronutrient needs that go with that. It's a massive, massive challenge. So to move on to the topic, I'd like to break it down into three parts. 
Um, how do people form their opinions? I mean, what has led to this level of despondency? I threw up a couple of examples there, but they obviously have underlying reasons as well. Let's talk about consumer trust and, and what it means, and, and certainly what it means for us going forward as a, as a food exporting nation. And we'll talk about the digital age and what difference that makes. So let's let me let me dwell for a minute. Again, these are my musings. Not not saying anything categorically as fact, but really really interested in your opinion uh, as we discuss this afterwards. Um, so so people um, set set their own standards. We all have our principles and we set our standards. This was a really interesting experiment. Uh, it was published in Science last year. And um, what it, I, I'll take a few seconds to to explain this particular slide because there's a couple of slides coming and the graphs are very very similar. So this was an experiment where they took uh, people and they, as individuals, they put them into a booth, they showed them a computer screen, and they gave them two buttons, blue or not blue. And then they flashed dots up on the screen that were a variation of from blue all the way through to purple and everything in between. And they asked the people to categorize were they looking at blue or were they looking at not blue. And so, they, so um, on the... On the x-axis, you have got, on the left-hand side, you got very purple all the way through to very blue. And up the, up the y-axis, we've got the percent, the percent of dots identified as blue. So it's a pretty strong relationship. Obviously, no colorblind people inside in this experiment. Um, and the, the bluer the dot, the more it was categorized as blue. But then in their treatment group, they reduced the number of blue dots in the last 200. They were shown these a thousand times. There was, sorry, a thousand images. In the last 200 of them, they reduced the number of blue dots deliberately. And what they found was that people started categorizing purple dots as blue. So there was an automatic shift in, in the people's benchmark. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's an interesting academic find. But they went on. They did, they did this experiment multiple times. They, they actually told people that they were going to reduce the number of blue dots. They still ended up with the same slide. They encouraged them to be consistent. They offered them money to be consistent. And they still ended up with people's view shifting. Um, but they wanted to see if this also worked in complex um, situations. So they looked at, um, they, looked, they, they showed people 800 images of faces from threatening through to non-threatening. And again, You'll notice actually in the last slide probably that there's quite a bit of variation around these lines because obviously purple, blue, somebody's going to hit a blue button, somebody else might hit a purple button. With threatening faces versus non-threatening faces, there's very little error in here. You know, we've, we've, we've all got a very standard view of what's threatening, what's not threatening. But again, in the, in the treatment group, for the last 200 um, of, of the images, they reduced the number of threatening faces. And what they found was that, again, people changed. What previously had been non-threatening faces now became threatening. And they did a further um, experiment where they, they gave people research experiment proposals that were a, a, a plethora from very ethical to very non-ethical. And again, people um, assigned them and assigned them relatively correctly. There's a degree of variation here, but as you'd expect. And then in their treatment group, they removed, reduced the number of non-ethical um, proposals that were being presented. And what they found, again, was that proposals that had previously been regarded as ethical were now being view, viewed as non-ethical. So people's standards change, and that's really important. Second point I want to talk about is what constitutes evidence in a post-science post world. So this is a, a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. two years ago. And um, what it was, was an analysis of Twitter, uh, um, a half a million tweets, and how they were shared and what, what factors um, in, were involved in them being shared. So this is the, on the x-axis here, we've got the number of words in the tweet, or the y-index is, is effectively the proliferation of that tweet. And these, A is uh, tweets about gun control, so these were moral subjects. A, uh, gun control, B, same-sex marriage, C, climate change. And you can see it doesn't matter how detailed the tweet was. Tweets obviously can't be too detailed, but it doesn't really matter how detailed the tweet was. There was no proliferation of the tweet. However, if you include emotional language in your tweet, you can see an exponential increase in the retweeting activity of that. So people are, being, are more driven by emotion than they are driven by facts. Again, 
That's not a surprise, but here's some quantitative evidence, recent quantitative evidence to suggest it. And Steven Pinker, the Canadian psychologist, has highlighted this ironically in an opinion piece in The Guardian, one of the worst uh, purveyors of, of this type of stuff. But basically his point was that the media has exaggerated negative news to such an extent that people actually believe that the world is getting worse in every metric. You never, you never see a news story, for example, about Syria that nobody died here today. Instead, you see the news story that says that people were, were, were slaughtered, died in a civil war. So you, you, people get a very, very polarized opinion about what the news is. And just again, to put some quantitative evidence on that, on this, this was a, a paper published a few years ago by Professor Leroy out of Belgium. And he was looking at the Guardian newspaper, ironically, um, and what happened to the length of the, uh, the titles, the headlines. And around, and sorry, this was in health and nutrition. And around 2006, you see this exponential increase in the number of words, and it's still increasing, being used in newspaper headings. So the emotive language that was being added to the headlines to generate what I just showed you in that, in that previous um, slide. The third factor I want to talk about um, here in terms of how people set their opinions is confirmation bias. Now, we, are, we have a, an evolutionary drive towards confirmation bias. Um, we collect together in tribes of people that agree with us to go and fight neighboring tribes that disagree with us. This is the basis of human civilization, confirmation bias. But again, we're in a world where this is, has, has changed. So this is the same paper that was in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. Each dot, and it's the same data, so it's, it's dealing with gun control, same-sex marriage, climate change. Each dot is a tweet, and each line is a retweet. And what they've done is they've overlaid the political ideology of the group. So you have the Democrats on the left-hand side and the Republicans on the right-hand side. And what I take from that graph is that there is absolutely no sharing of information between the different political ideologies. They only share among themselves. So confirmation bias is being generated. And when you think that the statistics are that approximately 75% of Americans now get their news from social media, and social media curates the news so that if you like something, that's what your news feed gets populated with, we are seeing a world where of dividing opinions and, and, and basically reinforcement of our own beliefs. And it frightens me, actually, as, I, as I, I have an instruction to my wife and children, is that when my name is ever in a newspaper, never read the comments beneath the newspaper. Because the level of hatred and vitriol that is poured out in those comments section, that's poured out in social media, is extraordinary. Now, people have said to me, it's always been that way. We've just provided them a forum for it. I don't remember that. I didn't grow up in a world with that level of hatred. So, to me, it's, it's quite scary, and it doesn't take much for this to generate a platform for ideologues like we see around the world now elected into power in different countries. And of course, what, what we, we see a plethora of, of people with, with and I've, I've used a particular view here, I'm, um, I'm, I, I, I have no problem with veganism, I can assure you, on, until they start questioning my dietary habits. Um, but th this is the type of, of uh, uh, emotional media that is spread around through those social media challenges. So it automatically drums up that support and it gets shared to a greater degree. So moving on quickly, um, I want to talk briefly about the digital age, because this, this one I think is, is pretty short. Um, and people's main concern, I believe, about the digital age is that it is used, the dig digital media are used to provide information that is not objective, and is used primarily to influence an audience and further an agenda, often by presenting facts selectively to encourage a particular synthesis or perception. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a textbook dictionary definition of propaganda. And propaganda is not new. Two and a half thousand years ago, Darius the Great had his version of history inscribed on the Behistun walls in Iran in three different languages, the only three languages available at the time. That is our first recorded instance of propaganda. It's been with us a long time. But somehow, the belief that now this technology is available, it has set a platform for, for people to further views, often which are negative, and actually use them to get seemingly good people 
to do relatively unspeakable things. I mean, you look at this picture. These people aren't the, the hardcore white supremacists that you would, you would normally associate with this type of protest. But tell me, how is that different to this family setting in 1938 Germany, listening to this man encouraging good people to do unspeakable acts? It's no different. So, in my opinion, the digital era is actually a little bit of a misnomer. So, propaganda is the same, and it's been with us for a long time. We understand it a bit better. There's no question about it. The medium is a bit more pervasive, and I'll talk about that later. But importantly, we use the same media. So, we're not at a disadvantage here if we understand what people want. So, let me talk about consumer trust. Um, and it's really, uh, my, my, my challenge here was consumer trust in science. And the question really I'm asking is, is does New Zealand have a science denial problem? So Peter has, been, has, has spoken a lot about this, and he certainly argued that we do. When you think about it, we've got anti-GM lobbies, we've got anti-1080 lobbies, we've got anti-fluoride lobbies, we've got anti-chloride lobbies, or chlorine lobbies, I should say, um, and we've got anti-vaccination lobbies. And, and our supermarkets and, and pharmacies are full of products that not only have not been proven to work, but many of them have been proven not to work. Um, so yes, I would argue that New Zealand probably does have a, a, a science denial problem. So, but if we look at it, what do Kiwis say about science? Why would that be the case? Because I think it's important. If we're going to unpick this, if we are going to regain that consumer trust, we really need to understand why have we got that problem. So what do Kiwis think about science? So this is a Nielsen survey from 2014. 90% of them think it's an important subject to study. 83% think it's a worthwhile career to pursue. Obviously, they have no idea what we earn. 59% think science is important in their daily lives. Now, I don't know what planet the other 41% live on, but 59% um, apparently think science is important in their daily lives. 42% believe there is too little information about science. 35% believe it's too specialized to understand, and that's an important point that I think we need to, talk, to think about. 51% believe that there's too much conflicting information. Um, so you've got, different, you've got equally qualified scientists saying apparently opposite things. And I th one of the things that I think is most important, though, is that 62% of people believe that scientists need to listen to what ordinary people think, um, that we're not getting through. And if you think about it, the, the homeopathy, the homeopathy revolution has, been, has occurred because doctors don't have time to listen to their patients in the same way as they may have 20, 30, 40 years ago. Why don't they trust us? I mean, all the surveys all over the world suggest that somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of people trust scientists. We're, we're, we're right up there with doctors. We're slightly ahead of politicians, thankfully. Um, well, because, I mean, we've never done anything that should lead them to distrust us, have we? Yet, we stand on pedestals and wonder why they don't just trust us to interfere with their food. They want greater discussion about these things. And they also don't know who to believe. So if you look at Time magazine, the front cover of Time magazine in 1961 had Ansel Keys telling people he wouldn't allow his family to eat red meat more than once a week. That it was, it was the cause of heart disease in his opinion, in his qualified opinion. And as, as someone that was world famous um, as a nutritionist, had great influence. Um, in 1999, the cover of Time magazine was you shouldn't eat any animal products at all because cholesterol was what was driving this and cholesterol was going to kill you. And 15 years later, in 2014, they, they acknowledged, sorry guys, we got it wrong. Animal fat is fine, eat away to your heart's content. And over that 50 year period, we ran the largest experiment in human history, where we compared carnivores to carnivores. And our health system is now dealing with the consequences of it. So scientists, I would argue, are part of the problem. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up a point of embarrassment here this used to be a quote sitting below my email signature up until about five, five years ago. My argument was, the facts are the facts, and if you don't want them, you're going to accept them. It was never very successful for me as I look back on it. And is that true? What, I mean, is it true that all, we re, all people really need is to hear the facts? So this was a really interesting experiment done by the University of British Columbia 
the animal welfare team there is, is world renowned. And what they did was they brought in a group of people from Vancouver and um, they didn't know anything about dairy farming. They asked them questions about dairy farming to prove that they didn't know anything about dairy farming. And I've told this story to dairy farmers and I can see them nudging each other in the audience going, you see, I told you, the problem is they don't know anything about dairy farming. We just need to teach them. So they didn't know anything about dairy farming and, and then they ran a survey. The question was, how confident are you that dairy cattle have a good life? And nearly half the, oh, nearly half the respondents were confident that dairy, cows, dairy cattle had a good life. Approximately a third of them um, were neutral on it, and approximately a third of them were not confident. And then they went back and they gave them the answers to the questions that they first asked them, to tell them, to teach them about dairy farming. And then they re-ran the survey. And the informed public, they lost 50% of the people that thought that dairy cows had a good standard of living. Now, this is a house-cow situation, cows are indoors, etc., and people in cities didn't actually understand this. So there was a whole pile of things they didn't understand. But this is education. So it's not just about the facts. And it certainly isn't about standing on a pedestal and saying, I, 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 don't trust me, I work for the government, I'm here to help. Um, or trust me, I'm a scientist, or trust me, I'm a doctor. That trust has to be earned. And as, as Teddy Roosevelt said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's the great thing that we've been missing from the scientific extension model, actually, until very, very recently. We now have a, an incredibly well-fed uh, population in the developed world, overfed for the most part, overfed with the wrong foods, certainly, at times, um, but living in, in a, an era of peace that we haven't seen ever in the history of humans since World War II, or, you know, we, we dealt with conflicts in isolated regions. We haven't dealt with uh, the, the large majority of people in the world fighting in wars for more than 50 to 60 years. Now, to me, there is still a good news story, all right? So I'm not meaning to be despondent here. And one of the best uh, quotes that I share with my PhD students and my master's students um, one of the best quotes I've seen about science is that, um, from Peter Medwar is that I cannot give any scientist of any age better advice than this. And that's that the intensity of the conviction that a hypothesis is true has no bearing on whether it is true or not. And so we should, you should be able to challenge, channel our passion into our research. But we need to recognize that science is not simple, that these complex issues do not have simple solutions. Um, and to be part of the solution... We must be more humble. The consumer's concerns are valid, even if you think they aren't. So we, many of us have discussions about um, vaccinations, and obviously the, recent, uh, the, the current measles outbreak and epidemic is, is raising those, those discussions again. Um, and let, there's one thing I think we can agree on, that parents that vaccinate their children and parents that don't vaccinate their children love their children. So no parent is not vaccinating their child because they hate their child. And so the, the, but the course of science over the last decade has been to ridicule those people. It has been to drive them into their own groups where you get the type of confirmation bias that I talked about earlier. Instead, we need to recognize their concerns. So I was talking with Paul before we stood up here. One of the issues I had was that doctors used to tell people that there is no risk. That's not true. There is a risk. You're 10 times more likely to be struck by lightning, but there is still a risk. And of course, what does the media do? The media doesn't run news reports every night showing you the statistics of all the people that never had an allergic reaction to the MMR vaccine. But the minute we have a child die from an MMR vaccine, that's on the news. And so people's view of the world is completely skewed. So there is a reason why they should be concerned, and there is a reason why the scientific community should take those concerns seriously. We must empathize. We must be able to walk a mile in their shoes. And we must be genuine in that empathy as well because trust is a really fragile thing. It's hard to earn, and once it's broken, it's really, really hard to regain. So, look, I think there is, I think there is a positive story here, um, and particularly for New Zealand. Um, our food production system is, 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 is uh, uh, unique is, is probably a very strong word, but it is, a lot, it is very, very close to unique in terms of how we produce food in this country. And increasingly, the wealthy of the world are buying a process rather than a product. They're, 
they're carnivore, they're vegetarian, they're flexitarian. There's, there's different, different ethical and moral and, and taste and, um, and ethnicity preferences that the sellers of food all over the world are lining up to provide those choices as easy as possible. And we fill those needs um, in, in a lot of cases. When you think about it, we have an incredibly emotional process to sell. We produce the highest quality wholesome foods. If you think the, the, the best piece of advice I was ever given in terms of, of maintaining a healthy diet was go to your supermarket and walk around the outside aisle. Don't go up and down the middle sections. And you'll get the fruit and veg, you'll get the meat, you'll get the milk, you'll get, um, you know, well, I'm, I'm thinking to my own supermarket now, you'll get the cheese and yogurt, etc. And then you come down to the alcohol aisle. You know, so you get all of the really good things and you avoid all of those processed uh, individuals. Oh, we produce the highest quality wholesome food in this country. And it's something we should be singing from the rooftops. We're not processing it. We're not creating that carbivore environment. We have a trusted food safety system all over the world, an incredibly trusted system that we will not make people sick. Almost all landed fish species are sustainably harvested. Again, we have a very stringent quota system to maintain our biodiversity of the ocean. We have free range animals producing low carbon footprint nutritious food. And if you move beyond the carbon footprint of calories, and if you move beyond greenhouse gas emissions to warming effect, we produce extremely high quality food with a very low carbon footprint. We can put lamb and beef and dairy products on a supermarket shelf in the UK at a lower carbon footprint than a UK farmer can. That's an extraordinary story. We need to tell that story. We produce high quality timber for building, um, particularly in Southeast Asia. And we have a biosecurity system that is second to no one. Um, and, and that's including even our neighbors across the ditch. Our biosecurity system is extremely, extremely strong. Again, the media does not give it the credit it deserves. It focuses in on Mycoplasma bovis, a cattle disease that was, has never been eradicated by anybody. And I'm obviously have a, have a, a deep role in that. Um, and at least at this point, it looks like we're winning that war. Um, that's the, but that's the one that's focused on. There's very little talk about fruit fly. And when we have fruit fly incursions, how fast the, the New Zealand biosecurity system stands up, shuts it down, and keeps trade flowing. We have a really strong biosecurity system. We have a wonderful country. We have the geographical area of the United Kingdom with four and a half million people. We have massive areas of wilderness, still wilderness, for us to enjoy on Sunday walks or multi-day hikes or, or whatever, and extremely well maintained by the, the service providers that, that maintain them. We're very, very fortunate. And yet, you wouldn't think it. I remember my, one of my last visits to the UK, working with farmers over there, one of the farmers asked me, what the hell are you doing over there? Because they were getting the newspaper articles from New Zealand talking about how degraded our environment was. And there was an article in the New York Times last week, uh, last month, I'm not sure if you saw it, from a, a prominent New Zealand scientist. And if having read that article, you would be forgiven for thinking that we didn't have rivers of sewage flowing through the Southern Alps of New Zealand. Um, I, I'm not saying we don't have our problems. What I'm saying is we have a fantastic story to tell. We need to fix our problems as well. But I, I just wanted to put up this quote from Bill Clinton because I think it is, uh, some of you probably have seen it. I pulled it off a tourist site last night. Is that every person dreams of finding an enchanted place with beautiful mountains and breathtaking coastlines, clear lakes and amazing wildlife. But most people give up on it because they've never been to New Zealand. I mean, that, that is a former president of the United States. That's how he talks about us. How many New Zealanders do you know that talk about us in that way? How many in the New Zealand press do you know that talk about us in that way? But, and I do want to stress this, we must genuinely engage with consumer concerns. So despite all the positives I've just said, we've got fishing, bycatch, and biodiversity challenges that we need to deal with. We've got animal welfare problems that we need to deal with. We've got to make our waterways as sustainable as the general public in New Zealand require. We've got climate change. We've got our contribution to climate change, and we are going to have to adapt to climate change. And we, you know, we, we produce food, large quantities of it, and we use all of the technological advantages other than genetic modification to help us do that. So we need to embrace people's fears and concerns and, and genuinely and answer them. And we need to recognize, as I said earlier, that those expectations will continue to change. So when we meet the standards they're setting for us now, 
those standards are going to become more stringent. Remember those lines moving to the left when you take away um, ethical proposals, sorry, unethical proposals, ethical proposals then became unethical in their view. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, propaganda has been pervasive for millennia. There's nothing new here. The media is certainly um, is more pervasive. Every, every, propaganda has always been controlled by the people that hold the airwaves. Now everyone holds the airwaves, so I'm not, I'm not doubting that it's more pervasive. But the actual act of, of propaganda is exactly the same. There's nothing truer than we have lost consumer trust on a number of these things as well. And that's largely by not listening to their concerns with respect. It's par partly through egotism. You know, the, look at what we used to do 30 years ago and look at what we're doing now. We're so much better. That's true. They'll acknowledge that. But we want you to be so much better again. Educating the consumer is not the solution. We must tell our good news stories, no question about it. And we must engage, be humble and be empathetic. But we must acknowledge the validity of their concerns and address them. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's me done. Um, sorry, I, I, I should have said from the start that I was Irish and you'd have to listen really, really quickly to keep up with me. But hopefully there's some things in there that, um, that will generate discussion when we have our panel time. And look, if you want to follow me, email address is, is up there. I've got three Facebook pages. I've put two of them up there. And I'm on Twitter as well for my sins. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, kia ora. Um, I'll just give you a moment while you get the chance to tune in to another Northern Hemisphere accent. <laughs> I'm not Irish, I'm Scottish, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of Scottish history. And it's uh, great to be here today. So, we'll just get into it. The title of this presentation is Impact of Foodborne Illness for New Zealand, Not Just an Upset Stomach. I've heard that a lot in New Zealand, oh, I'm just crook for a couple of days, there's nothing really to worry about. But overall, when we're looking at the impacts, economic and societal, of foodborne disease, it is a big issue. So, um, as Paula said, I'm Director of Food Science and Risk Assessment and have been for about two and a half months now. <clears throat> I lead a team of approximately 30 scientists who've got experience and scientific knowledge in microbiology, chemistry, toxicology and food science in general. And we provide evidence-based advice for New Zealand food safety, the wider ministry, across government and many, many external stakeholders. And we work with the science community in New Zealand and some of the data that I'll be showing were generated by colleagues from ESR. So we assess and describe risk associated with food consumption, whether microbiological, chemical, radiological or physical. And thinking about physical, it's really about, you see, food recalls in the paper where gl glass or plastic has been found in different foodstuffs. And our scientists tap into international science and knowledge using New Zealand specific information, of course, and increasingly Mataranga Maori to inform our advice. Our draft strategy, which you may have had the chance to submit upon, has got the bold vision of New Zealand food can be trusted by everyone, everywhere, whether domestic or export. I'm going to put, um, I'm a microbiologist, so I'm really passionate about bacteria. I'm going to put a microbiological emphasis um, in this presentation rather than chemical food safety, as the data for the microbes are more robust. But infectious diseases are still a major public health issue worldwide. <coughs> Excuse me. In the 1960s, one of the American um, Surgeon Generals very confidently stated that we can close the book on infectious disease. We've got antibiotics now. It's all over. Well, look what, look, look what has happened since. Um, infectious diseases are a major public health issue. Um, their impact is often underestimated because there are gaps in surveillance systems, whether within New Zealand or worldwide. 
we're seeing an increase in AMR, antimicrobial resistance, and we're concerned about any implications that there could be for food safety. And also the emergence of new bacteria and viruses present new challenges. Since the American Sur the Surgeon General made his bold but premature statement, a whole swathe of new bacteria and viruses have emerged. Lassa fever, Ebola, Haemophilus influenzae, and the really nasty E. coli. My mother, who's from a farming background in the north of Scotland, would say to me when I was working on E. coli in Aberdeen, well, I don't know, I never got any of this when you know I was a kid. And I said, I said to her, they haven't evolved when you were a kid. These really nasty E. coli only evolved in the 1980s. So there's always new challenges coming at us. So our strategy at New Zealand Food Safety is we want to reduce and mitigate the impact of these diseases by lifting the whole, uh, lifting food safety across the whole system. And with the potential impact of climate change, for instance, we could face new challenges in New Zealand, like the Vulnificus in New Zealand shellfish. So, some Scottish history. This is the well-known international scientific journal called The Sunday Coast. <laughs> um, it is iconic in, in Scotland. If you're a fan of Urwilly or the Bruins, this is the journal for you. And this um, edition uh, is from November 1996, Killer Bug Puts 30 in Hospital. This was the start of the um, Central Scotland outbreak of 0157 infection, which I think is still the biggest general outbreak of 0157 infection in the world. <clears throat> it was that typical... Friday, if you work in public health, that typical Friday night scenario, half past seven, you're sitting down to watch the rugby with a curry and the phone goes and you know it's going to be bad news. And a colleague of mine who's a microbiologist in a town called Carluk, which is in central Scotland, it's near Motherwell, it's really um, old mining territory, coal mining, and just as an interesting side note, a lot of the most famous football managers ever come from that area, like Sir Matt Busby, Sir Alec Ferguson and Bill Shankly all came from that area. So Ken, the microbiologist from Carluk, phoned me and said, I think we've got something going on here because he'd seen three cases of 0157 in his laboratory in a week and he wouldn't normally see that number in a month. So he was immediately starting, his antennae were twitching. The um, environmental health officers in, uh, visited the butcher's premises, which was thought to be implicated um, on the Saturday morning. And we received the first outbreak associated specimens the following week, but we didn't receive the last of them until the third week of May the following year. This was uh, an immense event. This is another well-known Scottish scientific journal called the Preston Journal. And this was on the Monday, Town and Fear as Food Poisoning Tool Hits 35. Now, you can, oh, sorry, we'll go back a bit. John, John Barr and Son. Uh, butchers, home bakers. Any alarm bells going off? <laughs> uh, you can't actually make it out here, but um, his awards for Scottish Butcher of the Year for the previous two years were on the door. Scottish Butcher of the Year. Uh, this was the effect on the Scottish general public in response to this outbreak. We actually, sort of veering into the social science a bit now, we actually started to see people developing a fear of food. It was real, a real issue. Okay, so what does one of these events look like? When you work in a reference laboratory, you're used to getting nice pure cultures of bacteria. 
We don't normally deal with complete tissue and fluid specimens from people who have died. We don't normally deal with faecal specimens, eh, some of which are just frank blood. So suddenly, my staff and I were deluged um, in these different and challenging specimens because the forensic pathologists just had no clue and they wanted microbiological confirmation. <clears throat> so I would say at this point for the women in the audience that the entire staff of this lab was female and some of us were pregnant at the time. <laughs> but we still managed um, in the third week of January, we performed 6,000 tests on, these material, on all of this material, which was equivalent to 10 years' work in eight weeks. Now, you will note that this was over the festive period, Christmas, and a New Year, which is equally as important, if not more important, in the north of Scotland. So it was a major event. We also had a five-ton refrigerated container plugged into the car park and it contained carcasses, prime cats, mints, scotch eggs, you name it, it was in there. We did not isolate 0157 from haggis, however. <laughs> uh, nothing can live in haggis. <laughs> At the end of the outbreak, um, once the outbreak had sort of come to an end, there was a fatal accident inquiry, FAI, which is the equivalent of a coroner's inquest, because more than 21 people had died and more than 600 people were seriously ill. And the final reference lab load was a well over 5,000 specimens. And we were, in some cases, we had to try to do serological testing to see whether people had been exposed. <clears throat> the costs associated with the outbreak, and this is really just an um, initial... Uh, hospital costs, diagnostic laboratory investigations and primary care. There's no kind of like societal costs. Sorry. <clears throat> I thought my voice would be loud enough. There's no sort of a societal costs um, counted in this particular slide. But you can see that in 1996 it was well over a million pounds and if you kind of look at it with today's exchange value it's approaching two million that no inflation has been factored in. This was one outbreak. It was a big one, but it had a major impact. So on the back of BSC and also the 0157 experience in Scotland, eh, the Food Standards Agency was set up in the UK. And that's what FSA refers to here. And their purpose really is similar to New Zealand food safety in that they want to perform risk assessment, regulation to reduce and minimise food safety risks and impacts on society. So they've calculated that in the bottom right hand corner that the cost of foodborne um, intestinal infectious disease is a billion pounds, that's per annum, when you sum up the costs to individuals, employers and to government. So the numbers are really quite compelling. When you look at financial costs, you've got the usual health, health and rehabilitation, um, administrative costs, the non-financial costs. This is pain, grief and suffering. Um, with 0157 in particular, you can get really serious consequences, central nervous system consequences, where children in particular end up disabled in wheelchairs, um, they end up with um, end-stage renal disease, um, very serious and very expensive to treat. <clears throat> and in the same way as New Zealand, we're struggling a bit with data, the FSA um, has to rely on the Infectious Intestinal Disease Study of 2000, 
Um, there was another study completed a couple of years ago, but I don't think the data are available. So the data are quite old, and yet we have to use them to perform our risk assessments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, in the middle at the bottom, the first IID study only includes details for a few pathogen-specific level costs. So again, we are trying to extrapolate a in the insufficient data. Um, thinking about another <coughs> another pathogen, another nasty bug, Campylobacter, which every, most people in New Zealand would be familiar with, and this is the kind of um, oh well, it's just a couple of days of diarrhoea and then you're okay again. Actually, not. There can be really serious um, sequelae, that's um, after effects of Campylobacter infection, including guillain barre syndrome. Uh, people can end up paralysed or they can die because their respiratory centres fail. Um, Long-term irritable bowel syndrome and reactive arthritis. I mean, who'd have thought that you get reactive arthritis from a Campylobacter infection? Well, you do and it's a very debilitating illness. So all of these um, serious, not so serious, but still, you know, if you had it, you wouldn't like it. Um, you know, young men in their 30s who end up hospitalised with diarrhoea um, have described it as being the worst few days of their lives. They really, they thought they were going to die and then they wished they were going to die. So it's really not pleasant. And the costs associated with something like Campylobacter, you've got the usual sorts of treatment costs. Quite often with enteric, with gastrointestinal disease, there may not be an antibiotic that is suitable. So the patients are managed conservatively, you know, with intravenous fluids. Um, but some can be treated with antibiotics. Then you get the, the costs to the National Health Service, the NHS, with uh, the different lab analyses, GPs visits, and then personal costs where you're paying for your own prescriptions or transport you know, to the clinics, etc. It all mounts up. So what we learned in Scotland as well, and this is a, a effectively a raw milk scenario. The West Lothian outbreak of May 1994 was caused by a failure in pasteurisation. And I think it's still the largest milk-borne outbreak worldwide. 70 cases, nine cases of hemolytic, excuse me, hemolytic uremic syndrome and one death. Uh, hemolytic uremic, today. hemolytic uremic syndrome is a really serious consequence um, of O157 infection affecting the kidneys. Now one of the other impacts of this outbreak was it used up all of the paediatric intensive care unit beds in Edinburgh. So Edinburgh is a major city of Scotland and all of the paediatric intensive care unit beds were compromised with kids who were um, who'd been infected in this outbreak. And we isolated the outbreak causing organism from uh, human faecal specimens, from cattle, from the bulk milk container, from the rubber seals into the bulk milk tanker, dairy machinery, and they're all indistinguishable by PFGE, which is kind of like um, a fingerprinting technique, a forensic fingerprinting technique, similar to um, those used on human, crim human criminals. <clears throat> and the dairy owners were prosecuted, and the dairy was closed, but they'd lost their clientele anyway. So that outbreak of 70 cases actually it was costed out over 30 years the continuing um, health impacts and it costed out and this is in old money in 1994 95 at nearly 12 million pounds 
There's about £17 million pounds to date. But each case of HUS cost over £62,000 to treat. And that's because of the requirement for <clears throat> ICU and dialysis. So these um, outbreaks are very costly. Costly to the health system, costly to the individuals who are infected. And the problem really is, and this is entitled the New Zealand situation, but it applies elsewhere in the world as well, is that we've got under diagnosis of foodborne illness and we have gaps in our surveillance. So in general for foodborne illness, whether it's a norovirus, a rotavirus, um, what else, salmonella, a campylobacter, or a nasty E. coli, for every, for every case that actually gets into national surveillance, there are approximately 222 cases that go undiagnosed in the community. So we have under-reporting um, People might go to the GP. The GP might say, take a faecal specimen and send it to a laboratory. The faecal specimen may then not have anything isolated from it, or it might do, and then it might go into national surveillance. There's a lot of mites along the path. This is Compilobacter, where for every one that goes into national surveillance, there could be between 4 and 18 in the community. So even though Compilobacter is a big issue for New Zealand, we're still not capturing all the data. So, I mentioned DSR colleagues earlier, and DSR colleagues were involved in um, these calculations of the cost of foodborne illness in New Zealand. And the numbers are pretty big. If you look up here for Compilobacter, that's 74 million. 74 million dollars, and that's per annum. Every year, Compilobacter illness costs this country 74 million. We want to do something about that with New Zealand Food Safety, and we have done to a certain extent already. This is a graph of reducing the incidence of human compilobacter disease. And you can see that between, I can't, is it? There's a big drop here between 2007 and 2008. And, you know, self-praise is no praise. Um, I wasn't part of the team in those days. But a big reason why that drop in Compilobacter instance has occurred is because the Compilobacter strategy was started, where <clears throat> there was an emphasis put on hygiene, uh, processing, and also um, performance levels for the industry were set. And that is part of the, the rationale for this decrease taking place. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so it is more than just an upset stomach. Foodborne disease creates significant societal costs, not solely economic. Uh, a major global public health issue of long standing. New risks will continue to emerge. And our new food safety strategy will deliver enhanced food safety across the whole system. COI stands for cost of illness. And the graph I've just showed you of the downturn of Compilobacter. Um, in 2007, the cost of illness was $116.1 million per annum. And that's been reduced to $48.8 million because of the effective risk management and regulation 
that uh, MPI put in place or NZFSA put in place. Uh, so we've been successful in delivering on strategic priorities, reducing the incidence of uh, compiled bacterial disease. However, we can and are determined to do more. I'll just stop there. Thank you for your attention. You say we want to do the next big steps and compile a vector. Yeah. What are they? Well, we've been talking about that. Oh, sorry. I'm hoping to make close. Yeah, we've been talking about that quite a bit um, in our uh, sort of strategic teams. I'm pointing at Paul because his team's got a big part to play in food regulation. So we're wondering about um, being more visible on the ground, you know, being out there in, you know, in the processing environment and really lifting up the bonnet and having a good look underneath. Um, we are about to receive the results of another major study on Compilobacter, you know, the burden of illness in New Zealand with some case attribution data. So within the next few weeks, you should see some important messages coming out to from that study, and we'll be following those tracks. Maybe I can just jump in here as well. Um, we've, th there will have to be a significant scientific aspect to this. There's, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done here. Um, I think one thing we can reflect on probably over the last few years, we've focused very much on managing hazards, so the level of bugs um, throughout the food chain up, on, up until that point of retail. But we estimate that around about 50% of foodborne illness, I don't know if that's still right, happens post-retail. So once a consumer picks up the food, takes it into the home, there are things that happen in the kitchen that we don't always like to speak about. Then there's a consumption of the food, and all these things lead to foodborne illness. We, we, we feel that there is more that we can do in that space as well. That, that's not a regulatory function, but it is something that we in New Zealand Food Safety can, um, we, we hope we can uh, um, lead to some improvement there. I'm interested to know what the Ministry's point of view, or perhaps um, MPI and Ministry of Health's point of view is on the perception now that saturated fat is A-OK. -okay. Um, I'm not sure, I, I, well I can't speak for the Ministry of Health that way first, um, but the, I mean, the healthy eating guidelines allow for a consumption of approximately 500 grams of, of red meat per week. Um, anything more than that, there is, they, they recommend that there is an association with negative health outcomes. Um, most of that has to do with an increased risk of colorectal cancer rather than the association between uh, the intake of saturated fat and coronary heart disease. Now there was a paper many of you probably have seen published last Monday uh, that basically disputed that evidence. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that needs further discussion. Um, the epidemiological evidence has always been relatively weak. The increased risk is small at, a, at an epidemiological level. So if you, if you factor in an increased risk of colorectal cancer of 1.15 versus an increased risk of an association between abdominal fat and colorectal cancer of over 5, um, you, uh, you know where, where emphasis should be placed in terms of prevention. Um, can't speak for Ministry of Health, but that would be our opinion that meat, dairy, um, should be part of a, of a healthy and balanced diet, unless there's medical reasons or religious reasons or, or choice reasons for not doing that. Just going back again on the year, 50% of the year of Campylobacterial disease is post retail. At this stage, what are your plan of attack to reduce that at this stage? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, it's quite interesting that number is quite interesting that number is actually fifty percent that uh, fifty percent of the cancer bacter bacteriosis is actually post retail. Um, oh. I was kind of wondering whether you know at this stage should we have any idea of the plan of attack to reduce that? Because normally the uh, the focus is of actually more on the poultry processors rather than the the um, cases post retail. So, uh, yeah, just in, in our minds, wondering what would be the plan of action there. 
Yeah, well, when Paul said that 50%, he said 50% of food poisoning is not specifically compiled actor. Oh. So it's not just compiled actor, but, you know, we have done a big push and we have reduced the incidence of compiled actor by working with the industry. Um, what can we do next? You know, across the board of foodborne disease, we want to enhance the whole system. So we'll work with industry, we'll be swifter to regulate, and we'll also do a, a big priority in our strategy is to engage more with consumers and to find out you know, what's happening, what consumer aspirations are, and how we can work with um, the general community in order to keep food safer. I don't want to, you know, I'm a wife and mother and all the rest of it, I don't want to point the finger at the housewife <laughs> you know, or the house husband but you know by through engaging with consumers can we help to improve food safety practices in the domestic environment if i could just politically add to that and support 100 percent what fiona has just said um one of one of the i i, I learned microbiology in university but i'm not a microbiologist uh, well, one of the, the starkest memories I have was on reading, I can't even remember what book I was reading, but it was a description of a parent standing outside an ICU with their child um, suffering from E. coli poisoning and what the doctors were doing inside um, to that. And I think one of the problems we've got with any of these, whether it's foodborne illnesses or, or, or vaccination and, and infectious disease, is the vast majority of communities in the developed world have no knowledge of this, they've never witnessed it. Um, and so until they do, um, they're lax in terms of, of process. So we, we follow those guidelines that Paul mentioned earlier uh, routinely at home because of, the, of, of that description of what uh, a simple infection that could have been avoided by um, uh, decent hygiene in the kitchen could do to a family. I think people need to understand that to a greater degree. So, John, to your point, um, we can't just educate people about that. So how do we actually go about engaging people and actually getting that message through? It's a great question, and I'm not, I'm not sure I have the answer to it. I think it is a mixture. I think there is a bit of education, because you can't just play on people's emotions, obviously. Um, I believe uh, that that starts in school. Um, that as, as dietary habits do at start at school and, and so educating uh, children uh, about the, the dangers of the, of the microbial world that's not a case of having hand sanitizers in every classroom and everyone has to you know, sterilize their hands as they walk in and out although I mean if you look overseas that's effectively what people do in hospitals now you know there is so many uh, hand sanitizer pumping stations you walk in through the doors of hospitals to try and and avoid that uh, contamination with um, resistant uh, bacteria. So I think education is a part of it, but it, it's not just the importance of doing it, um, and it's, it's more than a, a happy message. People need to understand the consequences of not adhering to good protocol as well, I think. And that's, that's very different because although the press have the policy of it leads and leads, you know, when, when we're trying to inform consumers, it tends to be a very careful approach to not offend. I think we need to look carefully at how we do that. Hi. Um, in GFSA, MBI, and the other organisations that have been involved in food safety for a long time, put an emphasis on controlling or regulating industry. The consumers are a whole different beast and the way that they can be communicated with is different. So bringing the, the two science-based issues and consumer perception and consumer knowledge issues together, is, is that one of the major challenges of food safety moving forward? But maybe I'll jump in. Um, short answer is yes. Uh, we, we, we think we're pretty good, um, uh, we stand, I'm sure John and I might argue otherwise, but we, we think we're pretty good at working with the, the industry and, and, and technical agencies to understand how uh, hazards can contaminate the food chain or, or uh, microbes can, can grow, etc. And also, importantly, how to control those. Um, and so that 
has it management science? We think we're, we're pretty good at it. We think our regulation is set up in a way that manages that as well. Our regulation is based on the principles of um, HACCP, as you may well know, so hazard analysis and critical control points throughout the food chain. Um, and then we have a system of verification where industry runs its own um, practices and, and then is verified against that. So that proves or demonstrates how people are operating uh, appropriately. And that's all well and good up until that point of retail. And then, of course, all bets are off. You have an entirely different audience. The same principles of managing hazards in the food chain, whether they're bugs or chemicals or whatever, are essentially the same. But instead of a maybe 40-odd thousand food businesses that are regulated entities and, and largely know what they're doing, we're dealing with 5 million consumers who, who will have varying degrees of um, expertise and, and, let's face it, interest in, in, this, in this matter. So, so my feeling is that we've, we've got quite a bit to learn about what that audience um, needs. As John said, what their aspirations are, how we can <coughs> help them understand what, um, what matters in terms of food safety, and hopefully um, create the kind of behaviours that will allow those consumers to protect themselves. That's going to be a learning curve for us, uh, and, and it's, it's not an easy exercise. Hi. I'm a primary verifier actually at a meat plant, so I completely understand the challenges within the industry because once, like you say, it gets to retail and it leaves, we have absolutely no control. Um, consumers do have to take responsibility, but they can only do so with information. And I think part of the problem is food education has sort of gone to the wayside. We used to have home economics and teaches people about food safety, but that's you know, obviously not as big as it is in the past. So I think that needs to be one of the approach anyway, to educate the public, to make sure that we try and keep them safe in their own homes as well. But that's just my opinion anyway. Hi. Um, an interesting observation, probably, is that a lot of the community, public and hospitality, pick up their information off YouTube and everything else. Um, they change the menu from what they serve dramatically given public input. And so even though we talk about the industry being regulated and being verified and, and demonstrating it, it sort of goes out the window if something new comes along and there's a demand for it and everyone just jumps in to use it. Um, one of the examples we've run into recently is things like sous vide, where Chefs learn sous vide from each other and they have no idea what the risks are, but they've bought the machine, they've got vacuum pouches, and some chef friend of theirs says it's fabulous. So maybe our education still has to go, even, even though they're part of industry, and I know they're part of the routine, is hospitality and celebrity chef pro level is still people that, send the message and distribute the message, but they're still missing it. I'd, I'd like to absolutely support that. Uh, a couple of observations, harking back to one of the points um, uh, John made. You remember that, that um, Twittergram, whatever it was, with the, the pictures of the two, the two clusters uh, essentially communicating within their tribes and, and with very little um, interaction between them. I think we can we can use that same model and and uh, learn from that and how we as a regulator engage with um, the regulated party there, our customers out there. What what we find is that there are a number of businesses who will come in and seek to learn, and that's fantastic. And they'll work with their verifiers and they'll seek to learn from them because they have this commitment to try and understand how to manage their food safety risks. What we also hear though is that there's a whole lot out there who, while they may be verified, are quite reluctant to come in and talk to the regulator for whatever reason. We have a hard time engaging with that group. It's not that they, um, they are not committed to food safety, but, but we have a, a separation between us as a regulator where we hold a whole lot of information that could be useful for them. Um, and, and this group out there who are, are kind of interested in it but really don't want to ask. So one of the challenges we see is how do we, how do we bridge that? Uh, and, and how do we work through others to get that information to the right people in a way that's digestible and useful um, and um, it, it's something that those, those people are comfortable picking up and, and, and learning from others potentially other than ourselves. 
actually what I'm really trying to say there is um, we, in some cases we might want to take ourselves out of the equation and allow others to to learn through through other mediums and other forums we can we can feed into that but it doesn't need to be it doesn't the message doesn't need to come from us I think um, I just want to go back to the educating our consumers and uh, telling our story um, I'm, I'm a wee bit confused on which direction to take because the more that we educate our consumer about our process and about how we go about producing our food, the more questions we get. And also, considering your perspective, you know, that their, their, their bar of their standard changes. And so we're in a, in a battle that never ends in, this, in a sense. And I'm just wondering if you have perspective on that. Look, that, that is a great point, and, 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 and I think it will be a battle that never ends. There's an interesting book written by a professor at a UCLA called The Culture of Fear, and one of his theses there was that your average person in LA uh, had, had, I can't remember what the statistics were, but twice as many people feared being mugged as air pollution, yet air pollution was 10 times as likely to kill them as they were to be mugged. Um, and, and, and so a, a lot of it is um, saturating the public with the good news stories um, and actually explaining to them that you know our statistics on food safety like like uh, Fiona put up there you know our statistics on compilobacter um, sicknesses are, are improving but here is what needs to happen for them to continue to decline so um, but the, the standard in that we can quantitative quantitatively measure it and it's a lot easier to present it in the in the more value, judgment, emotional type of indices, their, their standard will continue to decline. I have discussions with my father. And should have, I should have stated my conflict right from the start. If you go back either side of my family tree, it's farmers all the way back to the, the Vikings invading Ireland. But, um, and so I've got a, a very strong, deep-seated love for the land. Um, and what my parents' generation used to do from an environmental point of view would now be regarded as an abomination. And they've made so much progress to now, and they can't understand why they need to make even more progress again, seeing as they've come so far. They've fenced off waterways, cows aren't going in, etc., things like that. And that is just literally, once we reach a standard, a new standard will be set. It's a little bit easier in the, in the food safety environment because it is quantitative and we can actually establish from a risk profile point of view what is an acceptable tolerance for risk. But then... Again, the consumers can probably challenge us on those, that if, uh, if our acceptance is, is 1 in 10,000, they want 1 in 100,000. They do not understand relative risk, which is, again, one of the reasons why the media uh, grossly inflate fear. They, they talk about risk, so the risk of cancer has gone up 15%. They never tell them that the risk of cancer in the first place was 1 in 1,000, so now it's 1.15 in 1,000, um, and, and people don't understand that. So I think there, there is an education, but the most important thing, and you, you actually stated in the first part of your question, is when you embrace a consumer and answer that question, get ready for the next three. And then three for each one of those again. It, will, it is exponential. It should keep us all in jobs for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's really just uh, a view internationally. Are there any countries in the world that are doing this better? Or more effective at getting through to the customers, getting the message out? through whatever mechanisms of communication. I think in like Scandinavian countries or other parts of the world that we could learn from and work with? It's, it's a great question. I don't have an answer. Um, I mean, I, the way people get their information now, it doesn't matter what country they live in. It's a, it's a global community. Um, I think I mentioned that the, the statistics are that 75% of Americans get news from social media now. That's not all their news, but they get a, a fair chunk of their news from from social media, um, so I think you've, you've got a global community. Um, there, there are certainly interesting differences. There was a very interesting article a few years ago about um, you know, the problems that we have here in New Zealand with binge drinking. And, and the psychologist was making the point that we, we actually don't have a problem with binge drinking relative to others. A lot of countries binge drink, but they don't have the same behavior problems when they binge drink as we might have in New, in New Zealand and in other countries, not just New Zealand, the, the point their point was making. So there, there's cultural differences as to what people will accept and what people will, will take on board from social media. But I think 
all that, 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 that playing field is probably leveling out with um, more modern generations. So I'm not sure, but I'd be very interested if anyone's got any ideas on that, I'd certainly be very interested in discussing it. Just a comment on that. You know, we're a, we're a small country and, and we're a small government and within government the uh, New Zealand Food Safety is a small department. Uh, we are very open to learning from others and we have good links into a number of regulators in, in North America, uh, in, in Europe, um, etc. And, and I believe the, um, the UK FSA does have quite a, quite a good um, uh, program in this area and, we, and we're certainly in discussions with them. But, but you know, we're, we're open to all, all ideas.